Welcome to CC, the podcast where you see what others see. Hi there. Good morning. So today, uh, what are we talking about? Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? Sassy here. Is anyone there? Hi, my name is Sassy. I'm based in Berlin and I want to welcome you to Sissy, the podcast where you see what others see. In this season, we're talking about movement. And today, we'll talk about dance psychology and how finding your inner rhythm and dance bit can transform your life. Our guest today is cognitive psychologist Dr. Peter Lovett. He's a cognitive psychologist with a special interest in movement and dance. He is head of the Dance Psychology Lab at the University of Hertfordshire and co-founder of the Movement in Practice Academy. Until 2009, he was reader and principal lecturer in psychology in the University of Hertfordshire, before, he also lectured at both Kingston University and Greenwich University and held a post of Senior Research Fellow at the Research Centre for English and Applied Linguistics at Cambridge University. A former professional dancer himself, Dr Lovett has developed his own methods for enhancing the way we learn and currently teaches at the Royal Ballet School in London. Also known as Dr Dance, he is the best-selling author of The Dance Cure – and Dance Psychology, the Science of Dance and Dancers. His expertise and research focus in experimental cognitive psychology in regards of memory, thinking, mood, language, learning, social bonding, problem solving, and dance and Parkinson's disease, work which has been published in several academic journals and has led to research to the effect of dance and movement on the motor and non-motor symptoms of this progressive neurogenerative disorder. Dr Lovett studied theatre and creative arts at East Hertz College, holds a BSc in psychology and English by the University of Surrey, a master's degree in neurocomputation from the Centre of Cognitive and Computational Neurosciences by the University of Stirling, and a PhD in psychology by the University of Essex. He is also the creator of three full-length theatre shows and is internationally recognised as a brilliant motivational speaker who has given dozens of TED Talks and has hosted and has been invited to appear in many popular TV shows and radio programmes. Good morning, Dr Lovett. What a great pleasure to have you here today. Well, good morning, and thank you so much for inviting me. It's a real honor to be here today with you. Dr. Lovett, you have spent most of your life dancing, thinking about movement, and teaching and writing how people are transformed by it. There is so much joy in your interaction with your audiences, but also in the way you write your books, the way you engage in life, and of course, the way you dance. Until today... You have walked uh, your life path, whether in good or bad times, dancing. But let us start from the beginning. You grew up with dyslexia, but now without knowing or having been diagnosed about these difficulties with reading and writing. And you could not read or write, as I've read in your books, until the age of 16. But you end up earning a PhD, a senior fellow in the Faculty of English in Cambridge University, And you're now running the Dance Psychology Lab at the University of Hertfordshire. And you're a best-selling author. How did this happen? Well, it's a bit of a journey. 
so the journey from being not able to read and write effectively to learning to read really changed in one moment. And our lives, I think, are defined by these one moments in time where everything changes. And for me, I'd gone through school and hating the whole process of reading and writing. And because I struggled with reading and writing, I always felt really stupid and I felt like a failure. And because I always kept failing exams and failing exams that I had to sit because I couldn't process the information. I was so lucky that I could dance. And when I danced, I felt completely different. You know, I didn't have that black cloud hanging over my head. I didn't feel stupid and I didn't feel like a failure. My relationships were better. My thinking was different. My emotions were different. Everything changed when I moved my body. So I became a professional dancer. And I'd always carried with me this kind of chip on my shoulder, the feeling that I was stupid. But one day I was rehearsing for a show in London and I realised that I wasn't stupid. And it was just a moment, you know, those moments in life where this one moment I thought, I'm not stupid. And in that moment, I realised that if I was capable of learning long series of choreography and I could move my body and remember these movement patterns and hold on to multiple movement patterns in my head and understand them, then surely I must be capable of learning to read and write and getting over the difficulties. So I started then to try to overcome my reading difficulties and to reframe reading in a more positive way and trying to understand reading and writing in the way that I understood dances and movement patterns and theatre. So I started applying that to the reading and writing process. And of course, that's quite difficult at first because you're defined by, by what you cannot do very often. But, so I had to keep convincing myself that it was okay to keep failing, right? It was, I was never going to be a perfect reader from the beginning, but that was okay. I wasn't going to judge myself and I wasn't going to let my poor self-esteem as it related to movement get in the way. So I started to read. Now, some of the problems I had with reading were that some words in English simply don't make sense. The spelling to sound correspondence simply doesn't balance. It's not there. <laughs> and sometimes my memory for strings of words was so poor that I wouldn't understand the sentences, even if I could read them. So I started to break it down. What I found was that I could read poetry because in poetry, there was some poetry had lots of white space on the page. Some poetry has a rhythm associated with it. You know, you go, de-dum, 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 de-dum. And it might have a rhyme scheme as well, where the sound of one word might be give you a clue to the sound of another word. And so I use these rhythms and these cues and clues to try to break down some of the codes of reading. So I started with kind of rhythmic poetry to kind of get into reading. And then once that door unlocked, it was extraordinary. I started to read books. And when I read books, when I used to read books or try to read books at school, then I became really frustrated and angry with the words and the, the not making sense. So what I decided to do, I read things. And the most amazing experience came when I first fell in love with a character in a book. And uh, it was a book by Tolstoy. And uh, uh, there was a character in it called Kitty. And I loved Kitty. I, I wanted to see her on every page. And I, I kind of got tongue-tied when she was around. And I got jealous of her lover. And uh, but falling in love with these characters changed the whole relationship I had with words, which is very similar to the relationship I have with dance and movement. So anyway, I then tried to do an A-level in, in English. Well, I did an A-level in psychology first and scraped a pass. And then I did another A-level in English, which I failed. And I thought, oh, dear, this is awful. I'm going to fail. I kept failing the O-level English and then the A-level in English. And uh, finally, a university gave me an opportunity to study for a degree in psychology and English. Do you know, I was so stupid. I thought that you went to university to learn things you were really bad at. I didn't realize you're meant to go to university and study things you're good at. Um, and so for me, I was really bad at English. So I thought, I know, I'll go to university and study psychology and English. I then did that. And um, I struggled. You know, it's all about those moments in life where you take on something new. You have to be prepared to fail a lot and learn from those failings, which is very much similar as you do in dance, too. Um, and I went through and took a master's degree in neural computation and then a PhD. And I was very lucky to win scholarships each time. 
And then after my PhD, when I arrived at Cambridge University, I was then in the Faculty of English. And I think I was the only person in the Faculty of English at Cambridge to have never passed an A-level exam in English or never have passed an O-level in English, um, having taken them and failed them several times. And what was really interesting was that my shame was still really present. And so the shame associated with not being able to read and write, even once I'd learned to overcome that, I was still ashamed that I hadn't passed those exams and found it very difficult to talk when I was at Cambridge about my failings. Um, now I'm, I'm less ashamed, so I'm happy to talk about them. But it's interesting how sometimes when you become a, a certified failure over and over and over again, that sense of failure becomes almost tattooed into our soul and into our identity. And it's really hard to break away from that. Yeah, so um, this joyful affair you're, st you're talking about between books and rhythm and patterns and dancing and also accepting your failures and rejoicing about what can you accomplish reminds me of, uh, of this Patrick Hernandez song, Born to be Alive, a song that is truly and obviously accompanied by dancing. So what do you think Patrick Hernandez thought when he was writing the lyrics for this song and he's repeating constantly that we're born to be alive? Are we born to, to dance? And if yes, how does dance keep us alive? Well, okay, so that, that song, Born to be Alive, formed a really important part of my development in childhood. I loved that song. And I used to go to nightclubs and discos and dance along to it all the time. I loved it. And of course, the lyrics are important too, born to be alive. And we are born to dance. I, as a scientist, somebody who's studied this for many, many years, I absolutely believe that humans are born to dance. And the reason I believe that, well, there are lots and lots of reasons, but one of them is that the human brain is specialized for movement. But not only are we specialized for movement, like an automaton might, might be programmed to move, but we're actually, our brain is specialized for picking up signals from outside of our brain. We have something called sensory motor coupling. Now, sensory motor coupling, you might experience in a, in a startle reflex. So we go, boom, we go, oh, you might, might jump. And the jumping is this idea that we've got this sensory information coming in. It's activating the motor areas of the, of the brain and makes our muscles go, oh, and it startles us. Well, this startle reflex is also the starting point for the sensory motor coupling, for the idea that not only are we startled by a sound, we might be moved by a vision or by a smell or by a taste or by the touch of somebody else around us. So our brain is specialized to synchronize and coordinate with the world outside. And of course, dancing is this aspect of moving us socially. It's moved by our thinking. It's moved by our emotions. And it ties all our physicality together. So all of that, we are absolutely born to dance. Uh, the problems we have in the world, I think some of the problems we have in the world, not to trivialize it, is that when we, when we repress um, an instinctual, you know, born behavior, then I think we're, we're in a bit, a bit of a trouble. So uh, I wish we could move more. I'm talking too much. I'm, I'm whittering on too much. I, I want to keep talking, but I'll let you ask me another question. Ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, of course. So um, what you're saying is that the dancing activates different areas. Like what I just captured was like the social and the cognitive, emotional, and I don't know, physically. So m could you perhaps describe us briefly about uh, what is all activated when we're, when, when we're dancing? Oh, well, the dancing gives us a whole brain workout. I don't think there's any many parts of the brain that are not activated as we're dancing. But what's really important is there have been several scientific studies or many scientific studies which have looked at the relationship between dancing and what's happening in the brain. Um, so we know that we have a... We, well, when people dance together, for instance, when people dance together in synchrony, then you get an increase in, in opioid production in the brain, which makes you feel good. But not only does it make you feel good, it also forms part of social bonding. And this is why when people move together in synchrony, even with somebody they don't know, they feel greater bonds towards them. We know that when people move together in synchrony, they report 
liking each other more. They report trusting each other more. They report a sense of feeling more similar in terms of their psychological values. And they show more pro-social behaviour towards one another, helpful behaviour. So that whole thing about shared movement being a glue that bonds people and societies together is really important. You can also see that in terms of people's sense of identity and the way you could look at youth culture. So you look at groups of youths, you can often identify group memberships by the way that people move, by the way they walk, the speed of which they walk, the style of their walk, the swagger. There's a lot of similarities between people. We know that that shared movement is part of group identity um, and social belonging. So from a social perspective, dancing together changes things about our, our brain, about the chemicals that we're producing in our brain, which then makes us feel good and bonds us together. Now, of course, if we're feeling good when we're bonded together, that's one of the elements that's holding a society together, that's bringing us. If we had the opposite, if we felt terrible when we were with other people, we'd probably avoid other people. But we don't. We, we need that society. That would help, um, for instance, by teamwork, right? Like if you uh, <laughs> introduce like dance classes into, I don't know, a love uh, team or whatever team we're talking about, a football team perhaps too, that should probably, because you say you gain confidence in your teammates, right? Yeah, absolutely. Shared movement. Well, oh gosh, where do we start with this? We should have more dancing in more areas of society. We should have more dancing in businesses. So corporations should have a place to move together. Those where we get cubicles and people can't see other people and they're not moving together is really damaging for that group bonding. We need more movement in schools and universities and educational establishments. We need more movement in hospitals and places where people are cared for. And communities. I used to love going to places like Italy And there'd be villages in Italy where people dance in village squares. You know, in an evening, there might be some music playing and people dance together. And you have cross-generational dancing. It's a very open social thing to do. But that idea of shared movement, I think we need to encourage more of that in more places. So in some sense, we need to take dance out of the dance studios and into the community and encourage or demonstrate dance to more people and to show that it's a very natural thing to do, just like walking, but walking with a groove. <laughs> so dance psychology is really different from a dance therapy, right? Yeah, I mean, there are similarities between dance psychology and dance therapy, but um, I'm not a therapist. And what we're saying is that, you know, there's a dance psychotherapy and dance therapy and dance movement therapy are really, 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 really important disciplines. I'm not trained in that tradition. Where I come from is uh, from a, re a pure research side and trying to understand uh, why humans dance and what the positive benefit of the dance is. Although we can use dance as a form of therapy, as a form of way of addressing mental well-being, looking at Parkinson's disease, looking at people with, with, with um, life-threatening conditions like cancer, then we're, we, we're not using, we're not trying to interpret people's lives uh, through dance. So we have social, cognitive, emotional, and communication skills, and the physical uh, part of the um, uh, uh, of this whole psychology around dance. So physically, how good is dancing, and how how much dance do we need to keep on shape? <laughs> oh, well, um, I think we should be dancing three times a week. And if we were to do, we have a program called Move Ashore, which is a dance for mental well-being program. Uh, with a dancer called Dame Darcy Bustle. And what we do in that program is to encourage people to dance three times a week for about 20 minutes per time. The research evidence suggests that we need to keep dancing for several months. And when you keep dancing for several months at that pace, then, th then you start to get changes in your thinking and your emotions and your relationships. Now, of course, we see changes really quickly when people dance. So you might get a short-term change in dancing almost immediately. But to get the long-term changes, where the change becomes habitual, then you need to dance for much longer. Some studies have shown that 
After eight weeks of dancing, you get some benefits. After 12 weeks of dancing, you get even more benefit. So it's kind of really building up these patterns, which is unsurprising. So you get the short-term high of dancing, where you get a kind of dopamine hit and the pleasure areas of the brain are buzzing, and you get that feel-good that happens immediately. But then to change that afterwards, uh, you need to keep going for longer. So now let us go a bit deeper into the cognitive area, which is super interesting. You were talking before about how you overcome the challenges arising from dyslexia. But I guess this impact in the brain has to be very strong. How does movement impact the brain with problem solving, perhaps, or, or other areas? Okay, so a lot of the, pro a lot of the thinking-based problems we have are based on us getting stuck in set patterns of thinking. So we get into these set patterns of thinking. So imagine your identity, uh, how you think about yourself, how you value yourself, all of the where, where you think your limits are. All of those are thinking-based issues. Think about your diet and how you change your diet. Uh, think about the amount of exercise you do. All of those are kind of thinking-based problems. We get stuck in thinking-based problem patterns. At the university, we were studying um, what happens when you improvise to your thinking. And one of the things we found was that when people moved their body in an improvised way, then it changed their divergent thinking. Now, your divergent thinking is your creative thinking. It's that way of, you know, how do I break out of this pattern and do something different or think something different? So you can, I mean, I know uh, I'm, I'm fairly stuck in some areas of divergent thinking because whenever I do the shopping, I buy the same food every single week. I have the same thing for breakfast. I have the same thing for lunch. I might have four or five different things for dinner. But basically, I have this set pattern. We're all like that. And what we found is that when we get people moving their body in an improvised way, it makes people more creative in terms of their thinking. And what we think is happening there is that it's giving people more possibilities. It's taking down some of the barriers that, that inhibit creativity. So we all have these Some scientists suggest that creative thinking is all wonderful, but then we develop these barriers which prevent us. We get so habitual in terms of our schema-based theory, if you like, so these set structures of thinking, that by moving our body, it helps us break away from those things. Now, it might also be to do with our mood changes as well. Some scientists argue that moving your body and dancing might improve your mood. And it might be that mood improvement, which then leads to a change in your, in your cognition. However, we've also found you get a change in cognition even without the improvement in mood. There's a relationship there still to be looked at. So what we know is when we worked with people with Parkinson's disease, for instance, people with Parkinson's have a deficit in divergent thinking. So in other words, they become poorer at being creative and finding creative solutions to things. And when we invited people with Parkinson's to take part in, in 10 weeks of improvised dance sessions, we found an improvement in their divergent thinking. And what was really interesting is that those changes in divergent thinking, which we observed in a laboratory, can then generalize to the patterns of thinking they hold in everyday life. So thinking about, you know, if you've, if you've got Parkinson's, for instance, you might have a problem with chewing and swallowing food. Now, if, we've, if we're really used to always buying the same food over and over and over again, when you encounter the problem that you've got to suddenly find a new set of diets that you can chew and swallow, a food that you can afford to buy, food that you enjoy the taste, food that you can cook easily and that your friends and family will enjoy eating as well, that's a divergent thinking task. And what we find is that when people have been moving and improvising with their bodies for 10 weeks, then their abilities to think divergently in activities of daily living, that goes up as well. So there's a real connection. And then, of course, we see that also in schools, but we also see it in mental health and mental well-being. Because in mental health and mental well-being, some of our issues are to do with um, repetitive thoughts, that we get stuck in those negative thoughts. You know, I think I'm useless. I think I'm rubbish. Nobody loves me. I have no value in this world. Um, and helping us movement can then change those, those, those stuck movement patterns To think more creatively. Can break this uh, pattern. Yes, it could break you away from set patterns of thinking. So I, I love 
um, how you you really portrayed all of these uh, amazing options that dance provide us with because you were talking about letters and I was picturing the letters, you know, what you couldn't be able to organize them like dancing figures in the air. And then through these patterns, you were able to organize them, so to say. And then you're talking about breaking free the patterns too, which um, I was thinking also, for example, I was um, uh, educated in a very conservative school, which I Thank, I had a lot of things to thank um, too, but if the nuns, which with I grew up, would have had dance classes, they would have nailed it. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, so there are different types of movements or dances that could work as medicine for different types of problems. Is, is that what you're saying? And that's exactly what I'm saying. Now, one of the issues we've got is, um, oh wow. Dance is not dance is not dance, right? There's dance isn't one thing. Um, there, are, every different style of dance has a different character to it. It has different properties to it. Some are more social. Some are more cognitive in their thinking. Some are more emotional, and some are more physical than others. So you get these four ingredients, and then of course there's music going on as well. So you've got multiple ingredients, and when you put these different ingredients together, you create a different type of movement patterns. Of course, those each stimulate humans in different ways. So if you have a particular type of problem, then you can put some movements together to help you overcome that problem, whether it's to do with learning, whether it's to do with expressing emotion, whether it's to do with being working with other people. So that's why dance is such a powerful tool. So if we wanted to enhance team building, we might use one form of dance. If we want to encourage Convergent thinking, which is the opposite of divergent thinking. Convergent thinking is where you're, there's one correct answer and you're, you're speeding up your cognitive processes to get there. Improvised dance won't help with that, but structured dance will. If we want to dance emotionally, let's imagine you're holding on to a whole set of emotions and you're holding on to those emotions, whether they're positive emotions or negative emotions, there are forms of dance that can help you to, to, to you know, express or communicate those emotional states. I was thinking about tango. How would tango help? Well, tango was the first form of dance that was shown to help people with Parkinson's disease. And so when that study was first carried out, they used tango dancing. Now, of course, that was with a partner dance. It was a modified form of tango dancing. But of course, it was you were in, in, a, in a kind of a hold and you were moving in a kind of strict way. And so, of course, there are certain properties associated with that. Now, for people with Parkinson's, that's great because something to do with rhythm and timing might be a problem. Now, of course, in Parkinson's, there are over 40 symptoms, four zero symptoms. And everyone with Parkinson's has a different profile of those symptoms. So we're not suggesting that all people with Parkinson's are the same. Okay, But sometimes in some people with Parkinson's, there's a timing issue that's going on. And the timing issue and the timing signals that the brain is producing has an impact on people's ability to walk. So they might take short steps, they might shuffle in their gait, they might freeze of gait, and they might have a fear of falling and they might fall more often. And what tango dancing does is you then cue onto somebody else's movement and it gives you a movement cue, which gives you a cue of how you could move. And so you're, you're, it's all, um, we, we, we know that there's, there's something called a, a, a rhythmic auditory stimulation, RAS, rhythmic auditory stimulation, which is really good for people with Parkinson's. So they put headphones on, they play a, a piece of groovy music that they enjoy at a certain tempo, and then that helps them to walk. Um, and people take longer strides, they fall over less, and they feel more confident in their walking. Well, actually, dance, so that's one method using a rhythmic auditory stimulation Holding on to another person as they move gives you, um, it's, it's almost rhythmic um, proprioceptive stimulation. So you're holding somebody else and you're working with their rhythm and timing, which might regulate either the person with Parkinson's timing mechanism and help them take longer strides and improve their balance um, to give them those cues again. Fantastic. Fantastic. This is brilliant. And... Um, we were talking about embarrassment <laughs> and shame. And of course, in some cultures, more than others, dance, you know, in the teenage years, 
everybody's more spontaneous and will start dancing and there's not a problem. But you get older, right? How can you break this barrier of shame and embarrassment to break this threshold and, and experience dance? Well, that's a really important point you're bringing up. And some of that is social and some of that is biological. Um, and we can change that in several ways. So let's just break this down in a few ways. First of all, when we ask people why they do and don't dance, we've asked thousands and thousands of people why they do and don't dance. And the major reasons why, why men say they don't dance is because of shame and embarrassment and self-consciousness. You know, they don't know what to do and they're ashamed of, of, to move and they think they'll be laughed at and, you know, there's a competence issue. So uh, what, what you're saying is absolutely true. There is this shame as it relates to dancing. Um, and now when we ask about looking at, well, well, are we looked at? And again, well, yes, we are looked at when we dance. We're looked at in a particular way. We know there have been some research studies which have shown that when people are grooving at a disco, so you go to a, a groovy nightclub and you're 18 and 19 and you're grooving away, you know, Charles Darwin suggested that human dance forms part of the human mate selection process. And other researchers have found that the way you move your body is linked to your hormones, your genes, and your level of fertility. It's extraordinary. And what's even more amazing is that the people you're dancing with can spot those signals within you. They, can, they, they, they make judgments about how attractive you are, how masculine you are, how dominant you are based on your level of fertility, for instance, or your genes. Now, those things are highly correlated with your fertility and everything. So in many ways, we are being judged. We are, we are communicating something really fundamental about ourselves. In some ways, dancing is the equivalent of being naked because people can see exactly your, your, <laughs> your, your constitution through the way you move your body. So no wonder people are embarrassed. You know, a, a two-year-old child has no shame and embarrassment of running around naked. They, they, I've got two children, and they, they just do it all the time. They, they, there's no shame. But I certainly wouldn't get my 10-year-old running around without his clothes on, and my 25-year-old certainly wouldn't run around without his clothes on, and I wouldn't either. Um, so, now, of course, so dancing, we, we need to... Um, so that's, that's one thing, right? We can understand why people are embarrassed by it. But the second reason why people are embarrassed is because of the social aspect of dance. We have this terrible thing in, our, in the dance world where we judge people on the ability of their dancing. We say to people, oh, you can't be a dancer because you're the wrong shape, the wrong size, the wrong blah, the wrong dad, the wrong dad, the wrong everything. You're the wrong everything to be a dancer, which I hate that idea. Everybody is born to dance. So uh, we need to change the social structure of dance so we don't judge people for dancing. We could do away with this notion that people say, oh, I'm a terrible dancer. It doesn't matter. You don't say you're a terrible walker or a terrible breather or a terrible eater or you know, a terrible partner to somebody else. And we should have movement as being the same thing. We should free our movement. And when we free our movement, that's when we start to get the amazing benefits from it. So I think we can get rid of some of the shame by stopping hiding dance away in dance studios. Yeah, we still have dance in dance studios, but let's bring dance into the light into the society and get everybody moving. So now we will hear Elisa Carrillo Cabrera, first dancer of Stadt Ballet Berlin, on how to let go and not care about what others think when dancing. I think it's a, that's, we go back to the point where people always think more about what others will say, you know? And I think this is something we should try to avoid. Of course, it's not easy, but it's exactly what we also try to go do on stage. Sometimes we also maybe feel insecure about something, but we have to let go and take this out. So I think people should really try to just feel it and not care about what people around will say, because I think we all have some beautiful way of expressing ourselves and to do it through movement. And actually, this is kind of a therapy too, you know? It will being able to show yourself to move it's a way of also opening yourself and i'm sure this can also bring a lot to you so moving together and now regarding the social element of dance we're as painted in the caves of our ancestries or as decorative dancing figures on greek and roman ornaments murals and frescoes dancing has occupied a preponderant place in history dancing and music have been a communal activity and expression of emotion from the time we're born, which is often celebrated with dance, 
until we're death. I mean, even carrying the carrying of a coffin can also be a type of a funeral march. So we will hear again Elisa talking about her experience and believe that rhythm is inherited in us since we're born. See if you agree with what she has to say. Well, I think uh, it's something humans be, being have, you know. I think there is this, uh, any person, when you play something, people start moving, people start feeling. It's a way of expressing yourself. It's like happiness. We move and we jump and it's exactly what music gives. So I think there is this inner connection. It's something more, um, yeah, I have to say it's like magic. You know, music moves you. And I think there is this connection that you cannot avoid since you are a child. It's like when you are in, in a, your mother's uh, stomach, it's the same thing. You feel this connection. So it's something that comes, I think, from from really inside our heart, our soul. It's absolutely spot on. Rhythm is an integral part of who we are. Our human body is in, is fundamentally rhythmic. Our hearts beat in a rhythm. Our brains function in a rhythm. When we walk, we walk with a rhythm. Our whole body... And society is based on rhythm. The moon functions in a rhythm. The waves are rhythmic. Everything is rhythmic around us. Um, biologically, we are fundamentally rhythmic. So yes, absolutely, it's inherent within us. Um, and uh, what we need to do is to come back to that, I think, and have that as the primacy of our being and allow that rhythm to come out uh, with, without the restriction. So we have already heard... Um about the different effects depending on whether the person that dances is a baby, a child, a teenager, or an old fellow. And you talk in, about this in both of your books and say why dancing can lead to bonding, but also to aggression. Could you tell us more about the social and emotional element of dancing and when does dancing become a way of communicating? Although you have already mentioned this whole hormone uh, released and mating uh, ability. But maybe there's something else we can add? Yeah, so movement is a fundamental part of communication. So we communicate by um, by moving with each other, we're moving our lips and our, and, our, and our tongue, and we coordinate our movements when we have a conversation with another person. The whole element of turn-taking in a conversation is often mediated by the movement of the head and the body and the interaction between two people. The communication of emotion is also really important. It'd be very easy if you've got a close friend and you see them walking down the street outside, you could probably tell what type of emotional mood they're in based on the way that they're moving their body as they walk down the street. If they're really happy or if they're really sad or if they're angry, we can communicate that. Animals do that too. So animals communicate through their movement um, and they communicate those emotions. You know, we know when a dog is about to attack us, right? We, it, it can see that. We, we know when to avoid a dog and we know when we can approach a dog by its movements. Humans are exactly the same. We've been using movement for, well, since the beginning of human time as a way of communicating. It's not always about um, expressing love. Sometimes we might express anger We could think of war dances where you have whole armies who would use shared movement to bond themselves together, to give themselves a shared purpose, and also doing those sort of war dances in front of their opponents um, would, would, would instill fear in their opponents. They communicate that emotion to, the other, to their opponents. And so dance and movement has been used in all kinds of theatres of war um, as a way of communicating emotions and intent to one another. Um, of course, dancing can also make you stand out a bit. And um, you know, I was a, a teenager. I used to go to nightclubs a great deal. And um, I, I was fairly uninhibited in my, <laughs> in my dancing, uh, which, which often attracted the attention of people who wanted, um, who wanted to hit me. <laughs> um, But that, that's just the way it is. And then other people, of course, can become embarrassed by watching people dance. So they, they take their own. Now, of course, if we think about dance, I know we've already discussed dance as a mating, you know, form of the mate selection process. If we are dancing as form of the as part of the mate selection process, particularly when we're younger, you can see why young men, you know, if one young person is then displaying themselves to to uh, you know members of, of the people they want to attract, 
and somebody else wants to attract the same people, they might might they want to aggressively get rid of the person who's dancing in a kind of peacocky type way. Yeah, they, they would get bullying, right? There's a lot of bullying. Yeah. yeah. Oh, but he, well, that the bullying is also part of this ridiculous social idea of what dance is and who dance is for. I got you know a standard thing at school where people would would find a pair of ballet shoes in my school bag, and then I'd you know I'd be ridiculed then, and people would make assumptions about my sexuality. They would make assumptions about all kinds of things to do with me because I chose to dance, and um, and then those become targets for bullying. Now, of course, I grew up in the 1970s where people were, were, you know, they were quite happy to say anything they wanted to say. There was no social constraints on what they said and how awful they were. But I still get messages now from people saying that they they also experience bullying. And sometimes it's really implicit. So I've got two sons and my older son, he stopped dancing when he was about 14 because He'd been dancing since he was a very young child and he got to 14. Everybody around him started to develop in different ways and, and he then stopped dancing. There was some social pressure there. And my younger son, who enjoys a good groove, he loves to dance, he's a real groover. Um, but the school he goes to, it's kind of seen that there's a bit of a, a, a challenge about whether boys should be dancing. And uh, and I think that's that's a really sad, terrible thing because then that just instills this idea that some people are are allowed to dance and other people, the society, even implicitly, won't facilitate them to dance. I, I guess there's a lot of courage <laughs> in people um, choosing to dance and people choosing to feel alive. Yes. So we go back to the born to be alive and feeling alive, which is really important. But the really sad thing, so it's fantastic for those of us who, who know about dance and we experience dance and we do it every day, that's wonderful. What I feel really sad for are all those people who have an urge. They they would love to do it. They go, oh, I would. They, they maybe they dance privately in their bedroom or when no one's around, but they're too ashamed to do it in public. I think that's really sad for those people who feel they're missing out because society is blocking it down. And there are, of course, other reasons. There are some religions and faiths, um, even now and through history, that have banned dancing because they they see dancing as being something evil or something that's uh, not or is disrespectful um, in some ways. So we get cultures and religions that ban dancing. And then you get people who I get people who write to me saying, look, I live in Iran and I'm not allowed to dance. Um, but I do dance. I dance secretly. And I but if I'm if I'm discovered to be dancing, then I could be severely punished, you know, severely punished for, for this act. And uh, and that's terrible, isn't it? When when you want to do something that you're born to do and your society prohibits it, then that kind of prohibition, I think, is really damaging psychologically. Even collectively. It's terrible. Ladies and gentlemen. Hi. We would love to hear your comments and learn about what you see. Share your input at www.ccpodcast.com and follow us on social media. Oh, I almost forgot. To accompany us in this season's journey, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And now let's continue with CC. And Dr. Lovett, you were talking about Iran and being repressive, but there's also something happening in Western cultures that it's inhibiting also this ability of movement and dancing, and that is our virtual technology. I mean, how important and how necessary it is in these times to be able to experience real social contact. I mean, already now uh, and, and know that the worst illness of this century will be the ones invisible in the mind, like mental illnesses and loneliness. I have here... Um, Uh, I, I was reading that the World Health Organization and the Global Burden of Disease Study estimates that almost 800,000 people die from suicide every year. That's one person every 40 seconds. These numbers are terrifying, Dr. Lovett. Yes. Uh, the figures for mental illness or mental poor mental health were high before the pandemic. 
and lockdown. And the pandemic and lockdown exacerbated that tremendously in the West. And it is leading to this epidemic of, of poor mental health, sometimes with tragic consequences. Technology has been good at connecting people in one way, but it's been isolating in another way. And having that social loneliness, it, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could use dance and movement as a way to reconnect people again? I mean, it's wonderful that we're, we're in different countries and yet we're able to speak, and yet we're confined by our microphones and our headphones and our wires or our chairs. We can't just stand up and have a groove and a boogie. We can't walk around one another. And that would be a much nicer way of doing this interview, I think. I'd love to move with you and groove yeah, with you uh, me too. <laughs> as we talk. I think it would change our conversation too. I'm sure. Um, but, but I think we need to find ways in our society to come together because that social connection is such an important thing. And shared movement might be a really good way of do, doing that. And something that I found quite interesting in your book, Psychology of Dance, which I highly recommend, is the fact that dancing would help brighten and improve self-esteem in normal people versus professional dancers. To what extent do you attribute this to bad pedagogues or bad teaching? Um, there is some bad teaching, um, and there's, a, there's in some sense, a bad... Um, Okay, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be careful anymore. I'm not going to be careful about what I say. I'm going to say this completely openly. Um, we, we know that some things to do with the culture of some dance forms lead people to question their bodies, whether they're the right body. It goes right back to what I've been saying all along, this notion of having the right body for dance. And, of course, there are some dance forms which prescribe a certain body shape and a certain body style, and they say you're not allowed to dance unless you have that body shape and style. And, of course, that is bound to have a negative impact fundamentally on some people's self-esteem. And, of course, self-esteem is really important because we know that low self-esteem is associated with self-harm, depression, and eating disorders, which can also be rife in, um, in certain dance cultures. I know of one woman who was an amazing, amazing, amazing dancer, had been dancing in this institution for many, many years, was fantastic, and she was then excluded from the dance institution because, and I quote, she developed a two-womanly body. And by developing a two-womanly body, she was then excluded and had to leave the, the training institution that she was training in, despite being an extraordinarily talented and amazing dancer. And that, of course, is bound to have a negative impact on people and it lasts forever. Um, there is sometimes... So I've seen examples of humiliation in dance classes where individual dancers have been humiliated. There's a hierarchy in some dance forms, and sometimes the hierarchy is so rigid that you're not allowed to question the level up from the hierarchy. And I think these need to change. Even in a really highly disciplined dance form, form let's break away from some of those ridiculous, meaningless hierarchies. Now, of course, as soon as you have this hierarchy, you have a, a You have a structure that allows people to, to have a negative impact on other people by humiliating them, by degrading them, by coercing them into doing things they don't want to do. And I think that's really, really, really dangerous. Um, and I think we should have a dance world where we can do without that, and, frankly. And, and for all, because dancing has to do so much with individuality, right? So Yeah, yeah. I mean, dancing is part of who we are. You know, if we are born to dance, it's a fundamental part of who we are. Now, of course, I recognize there's certain forms of, of discipline, of movement, where they want a certain style. But, oh, I, oh, I still struggle with, with, with it because dance is so fundamentally who we are. Um, I think you know, there have been lots of studies looking at the clothes that dancers wear um, and the impact that has on their self-esteem um, and the presence of mirrors in dance studios. And so if you're a you know, developing, I mean, I found it. So I was 14. I used to wear, I had to wear a cat suit, a lycra cat suit. Um, and I think there's a picture of one of the books with me wearing a silver cat suit. And um, of course, your whole body is on display. Every single part, every lump and bump of your body is on display. And, and that could be really intimidating and embarrassing. To, and I wonder why we have to do that. You know, why, why do I have to show everybody everything <laughs> to learn how to dance.
Professor Alawi Lutz, who is specialized in anesthesiology and is responsible for putting together a multi-element project in Charité Berlin, the hospital here, to avoid dementia after anesthesia, mentioned on a previous interview of a last season Colors how patients in recovery that have access to views to a green garden require less opioids in contrast to those recovering looking at hospital walls. And I want to ask you, do you combine dancing in the open? And have you tried comparing results of on testing dancing in a classroom, so to say, to dancing in the nature or in an open space? Well, I haven't done that as a scientific study, but it's certainly the case that I dance in the open a great deal. I find a freedom when I dance in the open. If I dance in a field or next to, or on the beach or in the woods, and there's something really wonderful about connecting with nature and synchronizing our movements or being inspired by the movements of the, of the leaves on the trees by the wind. And... Um, So that's really, really powerful. When we were developing the Dance for Mental Wellbeing program, we first of all filmed all of our um, dances in a dance studio. And then we took that to a clinical review panel. Now, the clinical review panel was made up of, of medical experts, but also with people with experts by experience. So people who have experienced a long period of, of mental health problems. And one of those uh, people who was an expert by experience said, look, You're doing all this dancing in the studio, but wouldn't it be wonderful if you did it outside? And so Darcy Bustle and I created our warm-up and our, and our cool-down outside in nature. And those are the sessions that people really enjoy doing because they're in nature. And it, it also takes dance away from the studio and some of the associations with that as well. It's absolutely true that we know that people who are more physically active, um, particularly after things like cancer care, spend less time in hospital um, be before being released. I think it's something like one and a half days um, is, is on average. You know, People who are more physically active spend less time in hospital post-operatively than, than people who are less physically active. So it's a really important thing to do. So you were talking about dancing being an excellent elixir against depression and anxiety. And you're a joyful human being by nature, But you too had to deal with depression and anxiety, as one can learn from listening to your interviews or reading your writings, through which you so generously share, um, Dr. Lovett, how you were diagnosed with a terrible cancer in the middle of the COVID pandemic in 2021, um, following a routine test. Would you be so kind in sharing with us, how did dance help you overcome these incredibly difficult times? Yes, well, thank you for asking me about this. The I was diagnosed with stage three bowel cancer. And um, when I was diagnosed, my doctor said to me, look, for what lies ahead, you need to be as fit and as strong as possible. And I waited just a couple of weeks, luckily, before being taken into hospital for surgery. And, um, and I had ra radical surgery to re remove lots of things. And... Um, And then afterwards, I was told that because we were in the middle of COVID, we were in lockdown, they said that if you get COVID in the next month, then you'll, you won't survive. And, um, and so it was really difficult. So I had a really great medical team who were looking after my physical symptoms, but there was no one at the time who could look after my psychological symptoms. And the psychological symptoms were the things that were the hardest thing to deal with Um, with, with the cancer diagnosis and the cancer, you know, as, as it went on in the treatment. There were three areas that dancing really helped me. The first is with um, my emotions. Lindsay and I have been married for over 30 years. We've got two beautiful children and um, we're very happily married. We talk, she's a therapist, I'm a psychologist, we talk all the time. But during the cancer episode, we started talking to each other in ways that were not true. We'd say, how are you feeling? And we'd say, oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. Yeah, I'm fine. You fine? Oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. Yeah, I'm fine. Don't worry. I'm fine. I'm being positive. I'm fine. And we couldn't really articulate exactly how we were feeling. My emotions were such that they, they were really pent up. And I'd have these terrible nightmares at four o'clock in the morning, which I'd wake up sweating and in fear. And 
I, I was in family, I was all trying to be positive and say I was fine. And I found that going for a walk, I would cry more when I walked. And the walking would bring on, they would, would release the emotion. And there'll be something where the emotion would come out. The other time when the emotion would come out would be I, every day I did a 20 minute Broadway dance routine. And I would be pretending to be on a Broadway stage with a golden hat <laughs> going, oh, one singular sensation. Da, 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 da. And I would have some time off from the catastrophizing because the emotion was one thing, the pent up emotion. The second thing was the catastrophizing. I'd wake up, as I said, at four o'clock in the morning having nightmares and, you know, worrying about wh when I was die and how my children would cope, how my wife would cope. And I, it was horrible. It was hor that, the catastrophizing was, was awful. And what I found was that by dancing every day, it gave me just 20 minutes off where I wouldn't be thinking and catastrophizing. There'd be something about a clearing of the mind, which just for those few minutes a day gave me some respite and it helped me build up some sort of resilience to help me, you know, to, to unblock that. I, I guess it was like my, my, my mind was like, was like a blocked drain and it was with all the dirt and negativity and the thought of the darkness of what might happen. And by dancing and clearing my mind, for, it could clear that blocked drain and would give me an empty vessel again to fill. And then the third area was the social element. And because Lindsay and I were spending so much time pretending that we were fine and not really telling each other how we felt, when we danced together, we would just take each other in a, in a hold and just hold one another and move. And in that holding and moving, we'd then be communicating with one another and we'd know how each of us really felt. And there'd be just a, a connection between us where then we wouldn't have to say what we're feeling. We could then just, just be it and feel it and communicate it. And we could then still say, oh, yeah, I'm fine. But we'd know that how we really were. Oh, gosh. I think any survivor from cancer can perfectly relate to what you were just saying. Thank you. There is a professor in sociology His name was Professor Robert Bella. He passed away a couple of, of years ago, and he used to teach at Berkeley University. He wrote a fantastic book. I think the actual title is Religion in Human Evolution. And in his book, he um, talks about reality and how reality is scattered in so different dimensions. He identifies He's as the overlapping of fields. He says that it is very clear that in human culture, there are no fields that are not overlapping, so to say. So indeed, to play, and in, in this case, you performing the musical, this action could be sucked into the world of daily life, and it would become part of the struggle for existence. So... It is not only real what we think it's real when we read a book, when we dream, when we dance as you were dancing and pretending that you were in a Broadway show. All of that, it's real. Because in our minds today, we think that that's only just like a escape uh, route of what we are living. But no. That is also part of our lives. And we need to understand how important that is to be able to combine all of those dimensions in the way we live our, our life and the way we pass our time in, in this world, in, 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 in this earth, <laughs> while, we, while, while we're here, and that all of that enriches us. And I love the fact that you poor danced and uh, into into that those difficult moments um not only as a way as i've said to not remind yourself of what you were living that it's of course a, a, a very good tool too but also as an act of rebellion to that you know and saying i'm here i'm alive 
and I can also be performing, and I can also dance. So it's fantastic. Thank you so much. And so the way you describe is、uh, dancing. I mean, there's endless possibilities on applying dance. You no, know, from prisons to schools to nursing homes to refugee centers, workplace couples, as you were saying, cancer patients, of course, babies, children, teenagers,、uh, young old people. These are all my notes that I was have been making、uh, through the interview. And you also mentioned Parkinson and probably other degenerative diseases. You have spoken,、um, Dr. Lowe, to a wide range of international conferences, where you have been able to address business leaders and state leaders and personalities from around the world, like Barack Obama, Oprah Winfrey, and Richard Branson, for example. Were you able to communicate them to give them this message of how dance can transform our communities? Yes, I've been enormously lucky to be given a platform to speak about the power of dance. But I tend not to only speak about the power of dance. I, I invite people to experience the power of dance, and I think my happiest moment is being on stage with an audience of, say, ten thousand people,、um, and seeing these ten thousand people who are not dancers in the traditional sense, and every single person dancing is just a joy to see. And to be able to demonstrate that, so I think part of what I do in my my lectures and in my talks is to share the experience of dancing, to to show people, to let them feel the power of dance and movement. And I love that. I just love it. It's a wonderful thing. It's like riding a wave, being a surfer on a great wave when it comes through. And I'm very fortunate that I can look out and see all these thousands of faces alive and.、Um, I mean, dancing is an expression of life, isn't it? If we ask ourselves, if as a question, if we say, "What is dancing?" Dancing is really easy to recognise tango dancing as dancing or ballet as dancing. But when we ask the other question, "Well, what is not dancing?" You know, what do we have to take away from the definition of dancing for it to be not dancing? Well, basically, dancing is the is the spark of life. Where there is a heartbeat, where there is a spark of life, then humans are dancing. And to see that spirit in people is is such a privilege. Well, you're such a generous human being. This is so wonderful.、Um, I mean, more than an activity itself, it seems like dance is a place where we feel at ease because we could even be moving without moving by simply being conscious of our breathing, and we could be experiencing movement in our brains by seeing it in nature, as you were mentioning, or hearing our own heartbeat. What I learned today is that exactly as every person has a voice, and that people cannot talk or hear, even then they are able also to express themselves in other ways. Meaning that each of us humans have its own dance within. So, can someone like you, Peter, help others find their dance, their groove? Well, I hope so. I try to do that by demonstration. So, allowing people on my Social media accounts to to see me dancing in different ways to hopefully inspire them to think about movement. We also work with people one on one. If people want to think about movement,、um, we can help people to do that. And of course, working with groups as well. So yes,、uh, if anyone would like some some help with with moving, at finding the groove, finding joy, getting rid of some of the psychological barriers that stop them from dancing. Either as an individual or as part of a team or as part of an organisation, then yes, I hope I can I can offer something that might help them find the groove. So dancing help us to open up, to connect with the rhythm within, and to enhance our human experience during our lifetime.、And、dancing make us smarter, stronger, and happier. Right.、Um, in case somebody would be interested in contacting you, where can they find you? If they have a look on my website, which is peterlovett dot com. Now, Lovett is spelt 
L O V for Victor, A for Alpha, Tango Tango dot com. And uh, they can get in touch through there. To close our interview, I would love to um, hear your comments, and I'm not going to interrupt you this time. Sorry about the first time. Um, a clip where uh, that we are about to listen, and this is what Rabbi Rami, professor of religious studies, told us about rhythm and dancing in a previous interview. I studied in the Zen tradition where if you move, you're in big trouble. Um, but but um, I think you know bodies are meant to move. In Sufism, we dance. In um, you know, Judaism, you shuckle. In lots of traditions, uh, you know, native dances. I mean, it's, you, you do. A, there's a lot of movement, and when you move, you know, the, the potential. Anyway, this is potentially true. When you move, you start to vibrate in tune with the universe. It says in the Bible, in the very beginning of the Bible in Genesis, that the Spirit of God is the breath of God. The Hebrew is mira kefet, hovers, vibrates over the surface of the deep. So like the, the, the earth is covered in water and the breath of God is vibrating over the whole thing. So the, and then the, the vibration becomes the word, you know, light and then land and all this stuff. The universe is the word of God, and the word of God is God's breath, and that's all vibration. So there's no, there's nothing solid in the universe. Everything is just dancing. Everything is vibration. So when you're moving, you're moving, you know, potentially, you're vibrating in tune with the vibration of the universe. When you dance, the universe is dancing with you, or the universe is dancing and you're dancing along with it. So movement is such a powerful thing to do. Well, it's been wonderful. I had a full hour session with him once where we were chatting about the about movement, and it was a really lovely session talking about the, these issues. He's absolutely right. There's dance, uh, movement is a fundamental part of who we are. It def Movement defines us as being alive. And a movement defines our ability to, to demonstrate that life and to communicate that life both to ourselves and to other people. It is a fundamentally important part of our human nature. And we should stop anyone from ever restricting us from moving ever, ever again. Ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much, Dr. Lovett, for a fantastic, fun, joyful and full of rhythm interview. Thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure to be on the, on the podcast with you today. So thank you. Thank you to our listeners, wherever you are, for having allowed us to share time with you. Please do not forget to check this episode's description to inform yourself about Peter Lovett's projects and publications. We will see you next time. Bye-bye. And remember to dance. Dance.